I want to thank um, Terry and the organizer for invitation to participate in this very um, exciting meeting. Um, my interest uh, has been in congenital heart disease for some time, and um, a Cricket gave a beautiful presentation earlier, and she really introduced a lot of the background. Um, so I'm going to be very brief. Congenital heart disease, as you know, is one of the most common birth defects. It's characterized by abnorm abnormalities in the um, cardiovascular structures, in particular, um, uh, human uh, and air breathing animals in general have four chamber hearts with separate pulmonary and systemic circulation. And so you have a right uh, atrium, right ventricle pumping the oxygenated blood through the pulmonary artery to the lung where it gets oxygenated. It returns to the left side of the heart into the right, uh, into the left atrium, left ventricle, out the aorta, and is systemically bringing oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So there's this very distinct right-left asymmetry and four-chamber anatomy that's really critical for survival of air-breathing animals. And it's disruption of this four-chamber anatomy that actually underlies um, congenital heart disease. Um, as Cricket mentioned, advances in surgical palliation now allows most congenital heart disease patients to survive their structural heart defects. And um, in fact, um, uh, many of these patients um, are living into adulthood with more adults with congenital heart disease now than their children uh, or infants born with congenital heart disease. Uh, and what has been found over time, and again, Cricket mentioned that, that patients um, with some of the same structural heart defects can have very different outcome. A particular note, for example, are patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. They have a very uh, stenotic uh, aorta with hypoplastic left ventricle and atretic or stenotic mitral valve. So the whole left side of the heart is very hypoplastic. Um, patients with HLHS can have variable outcomes. Some uh, after surgical palliation could live a relatively normal life and others undergo heart failure. Um, studies by the PHN network um, has shown that in fact, um, it's what's most important for the long-term outcome of these patients are patient intrinsic factors and not surgical parameters. And so suggests that in fact, um, something intrinsic to the patient is actually determining outcome. And so our interest is in the possibility of exploring whether genetic factors might be a contributing factor to uh, possibly the differential outcome in patients with congenital heart disease. And of course, the first step is the deciphering what are the genes that may contribute to congenital heart disease. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, so we um, have undertaken a large-scale mutagenesis screen to look at genes that can cause congenital heart disease using the mouse as our model system. And the reason for that is that mice have the same four-chamber cardiac anatomy as humans, so that's obviously important because it's a substrate of uh, congenital heart disease. And also with inbred mice, um, we can avoid the problem of genetic heterogeneity that you see in human studies. So it's really an ideal model system for studying the genetics of congenital heart disease. So um, we undertook a systems genetic approach, as I said, with a large-scale for genetic screen with um, chemical mutagenesis with uh, ethyl nitrosyluria. This re in introduces random mutations in the genome and allows us a way to, to uh, interrogate um, in a non-gene bias way um, for genes that can contribute to congenital heart disease. So we're doing a phenotype-driven um, uh, screen, and uh, the goal is to identify genes and pathways um, that may drive congenital heart disease pathogenesis. Um, by uh, driving this screen with phenotype, we're hoping the collection, the totality of genes may give us some insight. What are the main pathways that are contributing to the pathogenesis of congenital heart disease? And of course, we're also hoping that the, the totality of data we collect may also give us some insights into the, gen into the genomic context for um, disease pathogenesis. So this is just some um, ultrasound images to show you the way we do the phenotyping is by in utero fetal ultrasound imaging. This is a whole conceptus that you can see. Um, and uh, that's the frontal view. You can rotate the transducer, and you can see in the sagittal view the same animal, vertebral column, the heart beating way, and here's the head of the animal. And so this very um, relatively low resolution ultrasound will allow you to locate where the fetuses are. And with the in utero um, fetal screen, we don't have to worry about um, fetal um, demise because we can actually track them horizontally over time. And so using um, more high-resolution imaging with um, BVOL 2100, we can actually look up and get a lot of details and structures of the heart. So using four different imaging modality, we can actually collect um, very specific information about heart structure and function, pretty much as what you would do um, for uh, human fetuses or uh, even uh, human adult cardiac um, phenotyping. And so with fetal ultrasound, um, we are able to not only be very high throughput because it's non-invasive, but also have very high detection sensitivity and specificity because this imaging modality specifically 
um, uh, developed to uh, phenotype um, for cardiac anomalies. So using this um, non-invasive phenotyping strategy over a five-year period of screening, we've scanned 100,000 fetuses. Um, this is a recessive screen, so it's a G2 by G1 back cross, so they come from over 3,000 pedigree. And out of the 100,000 fetuses, uh, about 3,000 show evidence of cardiovascular defects. Obviously, only a subset of these will have structural heart disease. Um, but by doing the uh, fetal ultrasound imaging, we can go from the 100,000 to the 3,000 relatively efficiently. And we've been able to recover uh, more than 300 mutant mouse lines with a wide range of congenital heart defect phenotypes. They're just grossly summarized here. I'm not going to go through that um, with you. But suffice to say, most of the congenital heart disease observed clinically have been recovered in our screen. One of the surprising things was that we found that 25% of the congenital disease mutant lines actually exhibit left-right patterning defects. If you remember to the early part of my introduction, I showed you the, left, uh, the, the cardiovascular system is very left-right asymmetric. And that asymmetry is actually really important for establishing systemic pulmonary circulation. So maybe you shouldn't be surprised that um, mutations that affect lateral defects actually give you um, uh, some of the worst uh, and most complex uh, congenital heart disease. Um, one of the, uh, also one of the other um, interesting observations from a screen is that when you have a mutation that causes um, left-right patter patterning defects and congenital heart disease, that um, most of them will present with three phenotypes. So, um, so they can have cytosolitis, meaning this, the visceral organ cytosis is completely normal. Uh, cytos inversus, where it's reversed, a mirror, mirror symmetric reverse. So for example, the heart's pointing to the right, but the stomach is on the left side. Uh, sorry, on the right side as well, and which is the uh, mirror symmetric of normal. Or you can have heterotaxy where it's randomized. So this, this animal has the heart pointing to the right, but actually the stomach is on the left. And so when you have heterotaxy, that's actually when you have congenital heart disease. But animals that have cytosolitis or cytos inverses are completely normal. I wanted to bring this up because uh, this suggests that, that, well, we know that a single mutation can give you three distinct phenotypes, only the heterotaxy mutants with congenital heart disease. So when we're doing exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing and we're using sibling controls, I just want to point out that you may actually be filtering out um, mutations that could cause congenital heart disease. So for example, in the exact database, I think that that's something we, we should really keep in mind as a potential uh, complication. So all of the mutant lines were recovered. We um, crowd-preserved the sperm uh, so that they're available from Jackson Laboratory, but we also um, actually uh, provide very detailed curation of their phenotype that's also deposited in the mouse genome informatic database. So this is an example of some of the uh, uh, images that you might see from one of these pages of a mutant. Uh, we actually uh, have uh, added several hundred mouse phenotype ontology terms for uh, congenital heart disease. And we also use the Boston file codes so that we can correlate the uh, mouse uh, congenital disease phenotype with the human clinical um, uh, terms so that they're, they're cross-referenced. And we also provide, um, I forgot to, uh, yes, we also provide a lot of um, images and cine clips. So if you go to MGI, you can get a lot of detailed information about the uh, phenotype of these mutant lines. So of course, um, it's all about mutation recovery, not just getting interesting phenotypes. And we're able to do this by whole exome sequencing because we do our screen in the context of completely inbred C57 black six mice. So we can simply do exome sequencing, then compare um, any changes relative to the reference genome. And so um, at the end of our screen, we've um, got generated over 12,000 mutations and over 7,000 genes. If you assume 24,000 genes, it would suggest that we're at 30% saturation. Um, and of the um, 1,500 homozygote mutations, um, we see that 147, in fact, are pathogenic, or we're able to show that they're pathogenic. Um, Two-thirds of them are a missense mutation, and the remainder are split between um, a nonsense mutation and splicing defect mutations. And these reside in 98 genes. Um, all of the mutations recovered, the more than 20, 12,000 mutations, are searchable in a mouse model organism search page in the Bench to Bassinet website. And remembering that we've crowd preserve all the sperm, all of these alleles are actually available because you can regenerate them from um, reanimating the sperm. Of the 98 genes we recovered, um, 47 are uh, novel genes, novel meaning not previously known to cause congenital heart disease. And we also have 23 genes with multiple alleles. Um, and using that screen metrics and a statistical modeling approach known as the unseen species method, we can get an estimate of the total number of congenital heart disease gene in the mouse genome. 
Um, so this includes um, looking at the num total number of congenital disease genes recovered, the number of genes with one mutation, and the total number of mutations recovered altogether. And so this estimate is 272 genes, and remembering this in the context of a recessive screen. So this will suggest that our screen is at about 35% saturation, rem remembering that we've recovered 98 genes. So this number, 35%, um, is remarkably close to the 30% we came up with by just looking at the uh, exome sequencing uh, metrics. So taking a close look at the homozygote mutations in the uh, mutant lines where we recover the pathogenic mutation, we see that there are 151 of these homozygote mutations. Um, we would expect um, that 30 percent of these would be embryonic lethal based on the COMP um, uh, studies. Um, of these 151, 108 have been uh, curated um, with known knock -on mouse uh, phenotype, and we see that of the 108, 104 or 96 percent are viable to weaning. Um, that's not surprising because, again, um, we're, sc we're screening mice in mid-gestation, so this is selecting for genes that are not going to cause early embryonic lethality. Surprisingly, we also recover mutations uh, for, for null mutations in four genes that are not known to cause early embryonic lethality, but we actually get them to survive um, to near term. So this uh, suggests the notion of genetic resiliency, which is recently uh, presented in an uh, interesting paper in Nature Biotechnology. So what do we recover um, in the totality of conjunctive disease genes? Uh, we find that there is an enrichment for cilia-related mutations. Fifty of the 98 are cilia-related, with another 21 involved in cilia transduced cell signaling. We also see a, a number of endocytic vesicular trafficking genes. Overall, this would suggest that the disturbance of cilia, cilia-related function, may play an important role in the pathogenesis of congenital heart disease. This is just a, a diagram to show you some of the cilia genes that were recovered. I'm not going to go through this, but I just want to point out that we obviously recovered some of the cilia genes that are involved in human disease, um, including genes involved in motile cilia function, shown here. They can cause primary cilia dyskinesia, but also genes involved in, in ciliopathies that are thought largely to involve primary cilia, including uh, genes that cause Joubert syndrome, Mecogruber syndrome, nephronathesis. Um, and many of these genes you can see actually are found in the cilia transition zone, which is a, a, a very um, important region that gates trafficking of proteins in and out of the cilia. We also found um, many uh, cilia transduced cell signaling genes, uh, 21 in total, including those involved in wind signaling, in uh, hedgehog signaling, PGF signaling, and TGF beta signaling. Um, and so the question is, do these uh, pathways and, and, and uh, mutations really have any relevance to human congenital heart disease? Um, so we borrowed some data from the Pediatric Cardiac Genomics Consortium that um, Cricket mentioned earlier. This is data actually from the earlier study that was published uh, in 2013. Out of 27 de novo variants that were recovered, we found that 11 of them were in pathways identified by a mouse congenital heart disease screen, including genes involved in TGF beta signaling, wind signaling, hedgehog signaling, psyllium related, um, and endocytic trafficking. Um, again, to reverberate something that Cricket mentioned, we found that actually many of these genes are involved in, also have a, a role to play in exon guidance, neurogenesis, and synaptic transmission. Here's just a subset of the genes recovered, and actually now with the 98 genes, if we put it through pathway analysis, we see that one of the top pathways recovered, indeed, is involved in exon guidance and neurogenesis. So again, suggesting the sharing of developmental pathways in heart development and development of the, of the brain and the nervous system. Um, providing an explanation for the poor neural developmental outcome often seen with congenital heart disease. Um, another interesting finding that we uh, made was that many of the pathogenic mutations recovered actually code for uh, interacting proteins, that is, proteins that are direct interacting partners. So here are just some examples. So we have a mutation in one animal, that's ANC6, that causes a disease a different animal in NEC8, and we know both of these proteins are direct interacting partners, but these were recovered in separate um, animal, uh, completely independent of each other. And this is repeated many, many times. I don't, um, I'm, and for the transition zone complex, there are too many proteins to list. And so the question is whether, in fact, um, genes that are involved in congenital disease pathogenesis might actually be part of an interneptal network. And so to look at that question, we took the congenital disease gene and query the HPRD biogrid database that uh, has information on, on protein-protein interactions and generated interactome network as shown here. 
And we see that the shortest uh, uh, distance between nodes, which are the congenital disease genes in red, uh, has 4.7 edges. If you do the same kind of um, interactome assembly using random gene sets and you simulate that 10,000 times, we get 14.9 edges, suggesting that this congenital disease gene network um, actually is of functional significance. And so this led to this notion that maybe the interactome network itself may provide the genomic context for uh, congenital heart disease um, uh, pathogenesis, and that this may explain the complex genetics of congenital heart disease, which is really more relevant to human disease than um, recessive uh, mutations. And so can we provide some uh, experimental evidence to support that? So with that in mind, uh, we looked at ANC6 and NEC8 in collaboration with Jagashaw. We previously showed that ANC6 actually is required to activate NEC8. NEC8 is a kinase. It's actually the only kinase that's been identified in the cilia. And so um, in the presence of ANC6, NEC8 kinase is activated. Um, and so the question is, we have this mutation ANC6 and a mutation NEC8. Can these two genes interact in an epistatic fashion to cause disease? To look at that question, we uh, intercross heterozygous ANC6, heterozygous NEC8. Each one by themselves in heterozygosity has no disease phenotype. Uh, with the intercrosses, you get four genotype outcome. Of course, what's of interest is the double heterozygote. You would expect that at 25 percent ratio. We can see there's a depression. We're harvesting these um, in utero, so they're late gestation embryos. And we can see that actually we're losing some of them uh, much earlier. And actually, out of the 27 embryos, we did recover 17 of them show mutant phenotypes that are seen only in the homozygote ANC6 or homozygote NEC8 mutants. So it shows that digenic interaction, double heterozygosity, can actually give you disease phenotype similar to what you would see in the homozygote um, adult animals, suggesting this concept of multigenic interactions in an interactome network may really be relevant for thinking about human congenital disease. Um, finally, I just want to show very quickly that um, we've also um, been very interested in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, uh, which Cricket also uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it was surprising. This is one of the rarest phenotype recovered on our screen. We recovered eight mutant lines with HLHS. Surprisingly, exome sequencing analysis show that these eight mutants have um, no, no, no genes in common. Um, suggesting this, uh, this notion that they have a multigenic etiology. We've been able to validate that for one particular line where we can show that there are two genes required to generate HLHS. So we believe that this is a disease phenotype that is um, intrinsically multigenic in etiology, and we believe that there is a couple of other congenital disease phenotype in that same category. So to close, I just want to leave you with this thought that using system genetics with mutagenesis may provide a, a segue for um, really interrogating the complex genetics of human congenital disease. So not only can we use forward genetics to um, recover and gain, gain insight into um, recessive mutations that are in, in a Mendelian a genetic model of disease, but that these may lead us to uh, insights on the complex genetics of disease because I believe the same genes that are in these uh, Mendelian model can also contribute to more complex genetics of disease. And moreover, we think that using this uh, system genetic approach may give us some insight in the genomic context of disease pathogenesis. Uh, so that uh, looking at the totality of mutations recovered, uh, we may actually gain some insight on genetic resiliency. And one thing I didn't even talk about is whether there's evidence for protective versus pathogenic alleles, which I believe our screen uh, may have some evidence for, and also this concept of penetrance, which we touched upon a, a number of times. Um, and finally, I want to suggest that maybe there's real value possibly provided by generating a mutagenesis database. There are many, many labs um, that are doing screens. The collection of that data may perhaps allow another means to query sequence variants for possible functional significance. Um, and again, this is something that obviously will require some resource to collate. And so in closing then, regarding the question of animal modeling of human disease, um, I would like to propose that um, in selecting animal models, you obviously need to make sure that there is um, similar anatomy and physiology in your animal model to the human disease under study. And so for congenital heart disease, you need a four-chamber heart. The availability, availability of inbred strains is also important in the context of genetic analysis, and mice is uniquely suited um, given that we have completely inbred strains. Um, uh, phenotype ontology is also very important. It's really um, critical that the phenotype ontology used to describe phenotypes in animal models parallel the human phenotype ontology, and I think this is something that, um, that, that needs to uh, expand uh, with different animal model system under use. And finally, the, that there, sh there needs to be a way to quickly dissemin disseminate the phenotype genotype data um, in public databases so clinicians and other scientists can readily access that 
For us, Jackson Lab has been wonderful in providing MGI as a context in which we can do that. Um, and then finally, um, I think uh, Howie Wong um, may have mentioned the use of CRISPR-Cas. Um, ultimately, with animal model, can we then uh, use CRISPR-Cas as a quick way to do um, validation of human sequence variants? And so with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people that contributed to the work um, and support uh, from heart, lung, and blood. Um, I did have a lot of clinical collaborations. I didn't really have time to show the data, but um, we provide a lot of mouse models for a number of papers that have been published on different human diseases. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question for you, and then I think we'll move to discussion. So, um, so your heterozygotes are fascinating. So you didn't see complete penetrance with your two hetero with the two heterozygotes. Um, so have you looked at these animals in more detail and let them live longer to see what happens? So the double heterozygote animals, if they are cytosolitis, they're perfectly fine. If they're cytos inversus, they're perfectly fine. But it's the one with heterotaxy, they always have complex conjunctive disease and, and those expire. But the ones with cytos inversus are perfectly fine, just like the homozygote animals. So, so this is a line where we see laterality phenotypes. And we actually have uh, another line that does not have laterality pattern defects that we also have seen this um, digenic interactions. Um, so I think, I think that this is, this is the, you know, something that I think will be important that we can explore experimentally. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to do this more systematically um, based on the protein interactome. Um, so, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Have you crossed any of the other combinations? So you just looked at the one set of genes. Have you looked at any of the other combinations to see what happens as heterozygotes? So, um, we, yes, we, we have another combination that we've done that we also see interactions. And the phenotype in that case is actually milder than in either of the um, parental homozygotes. But we, we still see the congenital disease penetration. Some of the extra cardiac phenotypes um, seem to be milder or not present. But the cardiac phenotype is still persists. Okay. Any specific questions for Cecilia, or we'll open it for yeah, cricket. Cecilia, that was great. I was just curious about your um, genetic resiliency. Um, did those mice not exhibit the phenotype, or did they have a phenotype and survive? They they have congenital disease that's related to another gene that we were tracking. But the severe embryonic lethality phenotype known for the knockout is obviously not observed because we're getting these mice to, to term. So in other words, um, and one example is like LRP1B is one of the, the homozygous genes we found um, in, in homozygosity. Uh, the knockout mouse actually dies around nine and a half, ten and a half days gestation. Mm -hmm. So our mutants are being examined near term. So they're coming to, to, to term. So, so basically, um, that knockout, uh, that homozygous knockout really has been um, uh, rescued, if you will, by other mutations in that line. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily the pathogenic gene that we recovered, but uh, suffice it to say that the, the sort of the genomic context of that animal um, has rescued that null phenotype. Yeah, so we have the exome data just from the one animal. And so, um, yes, there are some suggestion of other genes in endocytic trafficking that actually may um, provide some uh, recovery of function. But obviously, you know, we don't have experimental data. It's just argument based on the exome sequencing data. Callum. Cecilia, I was going to ask you if you'd looked at cellular phenotypes across um, clutches without, or sorry, litters. Uh, across litters without, uh, cor and correlated them with the uh, cardiac phenotypes. So, like, so, um, so for example, so, ciliary. Right, right. So, yes. So, we, we've looked at uh, ciliation efficiency, percent ciliation, um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, you asking is it consistent between animals? Um, yes, they are consistent between animals. And right now, what we're trying to do is actually look at kinase activity. So in the double heterozygote, um, what happens to the kinase activity and the interaction between NK6 and NK8? So we're trying to do some biochemistry to really address that question. And we also, of course, have animals with tissues that we can analyze as well. So, so, so we're, we're looking at that. And this, these two mutations cause nephronathesis. 
And so we actually can also see that they have a kidney, cystic kidney phenotype, the double heads. Um, but I think they're milder, although we haven't looked so carefully that we've quantitated, and I can say it's truly milder, but they definitely have um, nephronothesis, just like the homozygote, but it seems like they're kind of, um, you know, it takes longer for them to get out to that more severe state. Other questions? A comment, sure, Peter. Uh, I wonder if the terms reduced penetrance and genetic resiliency shouldn't just be dropped because they're both euphemisms for oligogenic inheritance and actually imply things about the situation which might not be true. Well, I mean, if you say you reduced said? penetrance, your focus is on one mutation, and you're saying, well, this mutation has the characteristic that it doesn't always cause disease. Well, actually, the situation might just be that there's one, two, three, four other genes that um, determine together whether disease comes out, and, and your uh, focus on this one gene is just a historical accident. That's what I mean. It's not really a good term. Sure. No, I understand. Uh, but what would be the alternative? Um, just that these are polygenic traits that are complex. I mean, that seems like a long way of saying reduce penetrance. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a more honest way of saying it. <laughs> Cricket. But, but it's not necessarily genotype. It could be dietary. Um, it could be other things. So I, I think we can't just assume everything is Well, genetic. especially with left-right, there's right. a clear stochastic component yep. right. of right. right. So, exposures matter. Um, we know viruses cause disease. <laughs>